Good morning. Um, we're so happy to have all of our special guests here with us at Barcroft Elementary School today. And we thank r the National Reading is Fundamental for this opportunity, as well as Riff of Northern Virginia and their proud supporters, Macy's. We're honored to have some very important visitors with us today, Arthur Stephen Lampium and illustrator Gregory Christie of the book, Philip Reed Saves the Statue of Freedom to share with all of you students here today and those of you who are watching this special event online. We're so thrilled to welcome you all today and I will turn it over to Carol Rasco, Reading is Fundamentals President and CEO for a few additional words before we get started. Thank you kids. Thank you. I am so glad to be here with you today and I love your blue shirts. They're riff blue. Is that your school color? Yeah. Oh, you didn't pick that blue just because it's Riff Day? <laughs> oh, wow. Well, those shirts look great. We're glad to see that blue, but above all, we're glad to see your faces and to be here with you today. You and your school and the Arlington Public Schools, along with Riff of Northern Virginia, are very special partners with Riff every day, all year long. And we chose you to be the place today for a very special announcement. Now, I need a little help in saying thank you to some people. You know, I go places and they introduce 45 people and, and they don't even say thank you. They just kind of go, we want to introduce these guests. But I know that we cannot raise the roof and scare our guests that are on the web. So I saw you all do something earlier and you did it really well and you just went like this, didn't you, with both hands? Didn't I see you do that? Okay, so when we say our thank yous, could you do that and that'll signal to these people that they're somebody special. So I want you to just quietly turn your head and there's a lady back there, I want her to raise her hand, JJ Johnson. She has helped us with Riff of Northern Virginia to put this together. Can we do the thumbs up for her? Thank you, JJ. And then we have members of her board here, one of whom I understand taught one of your teachers or your librarian. Oh my goodness. So would the, the board members of the Riff of Northern Virginia raise your hand? And let's thank them, thumbs up. Great, and we thank you. Now, there are some other people here perhaps, and I'm not gonna have all of them raise their hand, but we're gonna thank them. Uh, Gail Kelly, the elementary school language arts specialist for your public school system. Julie Rotherham, your PTA president. And Noah Simon, the school board liaison. Can we give them the thumbs up and say thank you? Now, the RIF National Office serves schools all over the country. Now. I didn't say schools like yours, did I? Because they're not all this wonderful, let me assure you. This is just such a great place. But anyway, we have one of our board members here today, and she's not just a board member. She is the daughter of the person who founded RIF 47 years ago. That makes us kind of an old organization, doesn't it? But we're still exciting because we're still talking about books. So I want you to meet our friend and our board member, Margie Pastor, back there. And can we give her a thumbs up? Oh, that's, maybe this is the wiggling thumb. I don't know, I'm learning new things here. And then I want you to thank all of the RIF people from the national office that are here today that are making sure that your friends across the country can hear this and see it. So would the RIF staff raise your hands and will you help me give them the thumbs up and a thank you for all they've done. Well you've met our special guest, the author and the illustrator and we again thank you for being here with us today. Today we're announcing the 2014 Multicultural Book Collection which is displayed on the table back here. It has 40 books in it, and it shows different cultures in literacy and also emphasizes 
science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, or STEAM as we call it. Now this collection was put together with the support of one of Riff's greatest friends, Macy's. And for more than 10 years, they have helped Riff bring books to boys and girls. And in fact, last summer in our annual campaign, we distributed the 10 millionth book that Macy's helped us pay for. So this book about Philip Reed is one of the 40 books this year, and we're so excited to be here to share that story with you today. And so now, will you put on your traveling cap and let's go on a little journey and learn something about Philip Reed. So, before we talk to our famous guest, let's tell the story. And you've studied it in your classrooms, but we have our other classrooms across the country, 2,600 of them, that will have children that haven't gotten their books yet. So we'll just tell the story pretty quickly. Philip Reed was a little boy on a plantation where he lived with his mother. And he learned how to do things with arts and crafts by working with this older man, Jim, who was a slave from Africa. Philip's mother told him when he was about 10 years old that they weren't free, but she told him that one of these days they would be, and he needed to get ready for that. On this plantation, he learned how to do things from other people who worked in the arts and crafts, like making horseshoes for horses. One day, this fancy man, Clark Mills from Washington, came to the plantation to work in the master's house. And Philip Reed, because he knew how to do things, he helped this Clark Mills. And Mr. Mills was so tickled with Philip Reed's work that he actually bought him from the master. And Philip Reed's mama did not like that. And he went to work with a foundry. Now a foundry is kind of a complicated thing. They make statues and they made them out of bronze. So what they did was they melted copper and tin and had to get it really, really, really hot. And there's little old Philip, look at him taking care of this fire to melt these metals. That's a lot of metal, isn't it? Yeah. And see, there's Philip. Well, one day, the U.S., the United States decided they wanted a statue on top of the Capitol building. So you're in Arlington, so you've gone downtown in Washington, D.C., and you've looked at the Capitol, and on top of that Capitol is a statue. Well, the U.S. government decided they wanted it. To make a statue, evidently, you make a mold. And the mold's made out of one kind of material. Then you have to take the mold apart and pour that hot metal in. So here's the <coughs> statue. Great big huge because it's on top of the Capitol building, right? They got the mold to Washington, but they couldn't figure out how to open it up so they could make a statue out of it. And all these men are trying to figure out how in the world to take that mold apart. This guy right here from another country said it could not be done. And those guys right there were upset because they said we have to do it. All of a sudden, that Clark Mills, he said, you know what? I know who can do this. His name is Philip Reed. He's my assistant. <coughs> so there's Philip Reed. He comes to the Capitol building and he takes the statue apart, the mold. There he is and you can just see how big the statue is by the head. He did it. And the reason we've got that statue the Statue of Freedom, it's called, on the top of the Capitol building. The reason it didn't all break into pieces and they had to do it all over again is because of Philip Reed. So that's our story. 
and we have our authors. You know the most fun thing about doing something like this? You get to meet famous people. You get to meet Greg Christie, who's famous, famous, famous. He even did the Kwanzaa stamp. Um, on December the 9th, the U.S. Department, the U.S. Postal Service celebrated his work on the Kwanzaa stamp. And then Steve Lapham, who's a writer and an editor and a historian. So this will be very fun for us. So let's just start with question. And we'll start with you. This question is actually from Mrs. Thorne's third graders at Eastside School in Chambers County, Alabama. You know where that is? Down there, kind of down from Atlanta. So what Miss Chambers students want to know is, is this a biography? How do you know what you know about Philip Reed? Ah, well, it, it started one day when uh, my co-author actually, Dr. Eugene Walton, an elderly black man, an African-American who's a historian, walked into our office and said, I want kids to find out about Philip Reed and what he did. I want uh, everybody to know about Philip Reed and what he did. And I said, uh, well, tell me the story he did. I said, is there evidence about that? Do we have some kind of record of, of what he did? Is there a song that was written about him or is there writing on paper? Is there a letter to the editor? Uh, I mean, a letter, a personal letter? Well, he showed me a document that's on the inside cover of our book now. They took a picture of it so that you can see it too. It's tough to read because it's handwriting, but Philip Reed's name appears three places in that document. If you look for it, maybe get help with an adult. But there's some information in here about Philip. And we'll talk about that some more. And I'll just show you on the back page. That's the back inside cover, same thing, but on the back page is a pay stub that has Philip Reed's name at the top. So yes, we have some evidence about what this man did. So it's a, a biography of sorts, a historical biography we would say, or historical fiction? His, you could say historical biography, historical p fiction. We did have to make some things up. And I want to be very honest with you. We don't actually know uh, the name of his mother. We don't know the name of the man who helped him. But we do know that young slaves who were being trained for a trade learned about the blacksmith and his work with horseshoes. They might learn about pottery. Um, they might learn about weaving. They might learn about how to use plaster to make fancy designs on the walls of a mansion. So Philip Reed was being trained by somebody and he had a mother who cared about him. So we did invent some names that were common at the time to help tell the story about what probably happened to Philip as a boy so that he was ready to work as a skilled laborer in a foundry. So Mr. Lapham, so you did the research um, and then, how did you get into this, Mr. Christie? <clears throat> I was called to be a part of this project. I'm an illustrator, just as you know. And you never know who's going to call you. You never know what kind of project you'll get. But for this particular project, I just got an email from the company Sleeping Bear Press, and they mentioned Philip Reed. And I never heard of Philip Reed. I always love doing biographies or picture books of people that are not too well known. Because I think history is a good way to learn about, just learn about people's life experiences in the past. So it was as simple as an email was sent to me. And then once I started to go on the internet and see Philip Reed's name and the things he had done, I felt it was, I could really do a lot of um, visual magic to it. I could put a face to Philip Reed. I could also put him next to the statue in a sense, connect the two of them together and use art as a means to do that. What were your biggest challenges as the illustrator? Well, whenever you do a historical book, you always want to be realistic about it. You want to tell the truth of history. History is not always, it's not always um, a happy history. 
And when we deal with slavery, I wanted to do a book that would tell the truth, but be appealing to kids and to be appealing to different age levels. So I wanted to have Philip as someone who was uh, kind of uh, someone who was brave and someone who could take his, uh, you know, take what his circumstances were and do the best he could with it. What were your greatest challenges? Greatest challenges was to find, to be accurate. That's the bottom line. And that means how did people dress back then? What kind of clothing did they wear? What did the buildings look like? What kind of um, tools were used for a skilled slave over one that worked in the field? So that's where the research came in to really make sure that it's an accurate portrayal of Philip Reed's life. This picture, this red picture of the, the flames mm -hmm. and of the foundry and melt in the metal, that's scary. <laughs> you know what? I actually have some pictures here. These are the original images from the book. This is one of them. And that's one of the challenges. You, you, you know, I've never painted a room illuminated by fire. Usually it's sunlight. So it was a different challenge for me. It was, it was different for me to try to take molten metal. Molten meaning that it's melted down and it, it's glowing. It's almost a liquid. And have that liquid illuminate a room. Plus the room's not a, a nice, pristine, beautiful, clean room. It's, it's a foundry where there's a lot of smoke and a lot of dust. So you have to capture the, the mood and the feeling of it in the painting. The words capture the, the mood and feeling, but the illustrator's job is to capture a feeling for the words and also a feeling for the actual, just the straight up visual. Well, Mr. Lapham, tell us about that statue. That's an odd looking ah. statue, kinda. Yes, it, there's a, a picture of the bronze statue right now that's on top of the Capitol in Washington, D.C., where Congress meets. The Senate and the House of Representatives meet in that building. And the statue started out as clay. Thomas Crawford was the sculptor, and he had a studio in Italy, way across the Atlantic Ocean in Italy. And he had probably a frame made out of wood and chicken wire, just roughly the shape of the statue, but then clay. So freedom started out just as earth, just as clay like you play with, like Play-Doh. And he made this wonderful shape. But clay's kind of soft, and it goes through actually many steps before it winds up being a bronze statue. Because you have to pour that br hot bronze into something that's the negative shape. You've done that with Play-Doh in a bowl or in a shape. Maybe you've done it with chocolate, but it's much like that. And at one point in that process, you have a copy of this in plaster, in white plaster. So freedom goes through all kinds of colors. Well, tell us about oh. the, the headdress. Oh, the headdress. And the oh, you'd like outfit. Oh, there was, there was some controversy and, and arguments over what she was going to be wearing. And it's a she. The Statue of Freedom is a the she. The statue is Who a woman. Who would know? Yep, it's, it's um, a classical figure. Thomas Crawford wrote about what he was trying to do, and he says it's a classical figure like a Roman or Greek statue. That was very popular architecture and art in America at that time was the ancient Greeks. So she's a Greek statue, but she has this unusual helmet on her head. There's all kinds of things about the statue, but let's talk about that for a second. At first, his first model had a soft, soft cloth cap the cap of the freed slave. But uh, uh, Jefferson Davis didn't like that. He was from the South, and he owned slaves, and he didn't like the idea of the Statue of Freedom being a freed slave. So he said, well, put something more military on her head. Put a helmet up there. So Thomas Crawford came up with the idea of an American eagle a bird that's only in North America. So there are feathers, and there's an eagle head, and there are even some eagle claws kind of coming down around her ears, which Gregory caught so well. There, there's nothing else like it in the world, actually, like this helmet. And, <laughs> and uh, so there, everybody said, okay, we'll go with the eagle helmet. 
And um, Jefferson Davis, have you heard that name before in Virginia? No. No? Is there a road? Jefferson Davis Highway. Jefferson Davis Highway, named for this person. So he was a government official of the United States. He was Secretary of War, but a few years later, he was part of the rebellion. He was part of the Confederacy. He was president of the Confederacy. And yet he helped with the design of the Statue of Freedom. So there's all kinds of interesting things going on with this statue, and it's all part of the story. It's all part of history. So I want to ask you both two questions, and we'll start with you, Mr. Christie. What was the most exciting thing about doing the illustrations, and what did you learn? Okay, well, I'll start with a visual. That's a part of the statue. And I know a lot of you have homework. This was, <laughs> this was my homework. And it kept me busy because the statue had so many details that it was exciting to paint each one, and, but I had to make sure it was accurate. And one of the terms that you would use is called scale. I know you might have heard of a scale that you weigh, but scale is also looking across the room and seeing something and being able to accurately portray it or, or draw it in a way that it matches up. So let's say I was doing a portrait if I paint the eyes, they have to match up to the nose in a certain scale. And the nose has to match up to the lips in a certain scale. Because if my lips were down here in the drawing, you wouldn't like that drawing. If my eyes were up here in the drawing, you wouldn't like that drawing. So it was exciting to do the statue, take something that is so solid and, and kind of reinterpret it and repaint and paint it. Because a sculpture is one thing, it's rock or it's metal. But paint is fluid. This is actually called acrylic gouache. Anyone use toothpaste? I hope you all do. <laughs> it's like toothpaste, it comes out like toothpaste. But it can turn into wonders if you add water to it. Too much water, it becomes too thin. T enough of it, it just right out the tube. It comes to the point where you can cover up things. So that was one of the things. The exciting thing was just learning how to render the statue in an in a accurate way. And what I learned was really about more about the time period and, and how big that statue was. Because when you look at photographs, you don't really get the scale of it. You don't get the idea of the height. So I really learned a lot about how tall it is and also how important it is to the history of the Capitol building. We have one minute. What's mm. the most interesting thing or exciting thing that you learned? And um, mm. just tell us. Wow, I just learned about uh, collaboration, actually. It took a lot of different kinds of people to make this statue. And I had a lot of fun working with Greg and working with my co-author who can't be here today, um, Dr. Eugene Walton. but. It wasn't just Steve, Steve, Steve doing this. It was working in collaboration with our publisher, with an illustrator, with a co-author to agree on how this would come out. And I'm very happy now to share it. It makes me real happy to hear people reading it. So we're going to ask your questions. The first question I have is also from Alabama from Lafayette, Alabama, from Mrs. Green's second graders. She has, uh, their class has two questions. One is, Mr. Lapham, what's your favorite thing about being an author? Oh, I think it's, uh, <laughs> oh, it's hard to say one thing, but at the beginning, it's a lot of fun. I mean, if, if you have ideas, it's poetry, it's a song, get that down quick in your little notebook. If you're working on stuff, you've got to have a notebook and carry that around with you. It can be a little uh, iPad device, or it can be pencil and paper. Um, so creating something right at the beginning, even if it's rough and there are a lot of mistakes, get it down. And then it's also a lot of, I've got to say, it's a lot of fun at the end to sit down with children and, and, and adults and see what they think of the illustrations, hear them reading the words. It's just, it's just fun. And then um, the question for you, Mr. Christie, how did you come up with the cover? How did you decide what to put on the cover? 
Well, a cover of a book is one of the most important things. You have to make people want to open up the book. So I thought about what were the most important aspects or the most important elements of this book. One is Philip Reed. The second is the statue. The third is the capital. And it's a very patriotic book in, in a sense. So I stuck to colors that were red, white, and blue. I also worked on a paper that was kind of uh, off-white. I didn't want um, a bright white paper. I wanted something that looked kind of old. And so I chose that paper to help capture the mood of the book. I didn't want you to think this book was done in 2013, like it takes <laughs> that time period. I want you to think that this time period was the 1800s, way back. So it really took time to really think about Philip Reed, the statue, the Capitol building, and America. Good, that's great. So now we have Miss Lauren from Riff, and she's gonna ask questions here. Hi everyone, so like Judy said, my name is Lauren and I'm here to get your questions. So first of all, I just wanna say, Hello to everybody joining us on the web. We hope you're having a great time. And Bancroft, can you help me say hello to them? Can you just turn around a little and give a little wave to the World Wide Web over there? You're being broadcast all over the world right now. All right. Okay, now we'll focus back here. All right, so I have a question for you first before I take your questions. If you had to choose to be an author or an illustrator, what would you choose? So raise your hand if you'd be an, a, an author, a writer. Ooh, okay, a couple more popping up. Okay, and raise your hand if you'd be the illustrator. <laughs> Whoa, okay, <laughs> pretty popular. Okay, and who would be both? Okay, right, you, that, you can do that too, you can be both, okay. So I see we have some future writers and illustrators in our midst. Um, who has a question for our panel? Okay, I saw one right back there. I'm gonna come back, weave my way through you guys. Did you raise your hand? Okay, can you stand up? Okay. And you're gonna speak into the microphone and tell me your name and then give me your question, okay? Okay, my name is Gabriella, and um, my question was, why did you write the book? Okay. Oh, well, when uh, Dr. Walton came into the office, we talked about the fact that many African Americans who helped build our national capital, there's not much of a record of them. There might be a list of names of who helped, but there's not a whole lot of evidence. But for Philip Reed, the National Archives has saved that record. They save a lot of papers and photographs of things that are important to the nation. And somebody thought it was important enough to save these documents. Um, April 16th, 1862, when all the slaves in Washington, D.C. became free. That's 3,100 people. And the abolitionists, blacks and whites, working together had worked for that moment. So we wanted to tell some of that story. And because so much of that story has not been told, we said, look at Philip. His story is documented. What he did, you can see it up on the, on the top of the Capitol building. He was part of that. He was part of that team. He was part of that collaboration. And very importantly, Philip Reed's statue turned 150 years old in December. It was, a, it was 150th birthday for the statue, which is why Reading is Fundamental thought it would be perfect to go in our collection. Lauren? Does anyone, anybody want to sing happy birthday to the statue? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, who has our next question? Okay. I see one right back here. Excuse me, guys. I'm just going to hop through you. I feel like Oprah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can you stand up and tell me your name and then give me your question and um, ask your question to the panel. Okay. Hi, my name is Milton. Um, how did you guys come up? How did you come up with the book? And Milton, you can actually stay standing up. So Milton's question was, how did you guys come up with the concept for this book? That's a good question, and maybe Greg can talk too about some of his ideas for the pictures. But in terms of the, the book, um, I, um, I work uh, with social studies teachers, helping them come up with exciting handouts for you 
and lesson plans. And that's why Dr. Walton walked into our office, because he wanted a lesson about this. And we ate lunch together a couple weeks later, and we said, well, you know, it could be even more than a lesson. This was Dr. Walton's idea. He said, it could, we could make this a book. And seven, eight, nine publishers, one at a time, said, nope, nope, we don't want to do this book. But then Sleeping Bear Press said, yes, and it became a book. When it comes to illustration, you don't just illustrate. You first need the words. They need the layout of the book, meaning like is it going to be a horizontal book when you open it up, or is it going to be a vertical book like this, like a portrait style book. After that, you have to break up the words. You have just a manuscript on a, on a sheet of paper, several sheets of paper, and you break it down into sections. So when you open up a book, each little section needs to be illustrated. But I don't just illustrate right away. I have to do sketches first. And that's when I'm doing the visual research. I want to know what the people looked like. What did a barn look like? Did, did skilled slaves have aprons and tools? Or did they work with clay, with pots? And I want to know as much as I can about creating the environment. And you go from a sketch into a final piece of art. Then you have to choose colors. If I'd have made this all bright yellow, it, wouldn't, it would have had a different mood. So I stuck with kind of orange and browns and earthy tones is what, what we artists call it. Anything feeling like the earth, dark colors, browns, fall colors. And I wanted to create a mood between this older man named Jim and Philip Reed as a little boy learning how to work with clay. So it's sketching, preparation, and then you do the final painting once How you How long did it take you to do the illustrations? Oof. Well, illustrations, when I actually paint illustrations, I can paint quickly. I can almost paint in a day or maybe about six hours to do one illustration. But a lot of work is done in my mind. And that goes, I saw a lot, a lot of you raised your hands. You want to do art. There's all kinds of art to do. Illustration, medical illustration, you could do painting, fine art for galleries and art collectors. But one thing you have to do is let yourself make mistakes. You have to keep practicing and know your materials. You, like I was saying with this paint I was talking about before, if you add too much water, it becomes very thin and it might even ripple the paper. So you have to know your materials enough to know how much water to add. And you have to make mistakes. You become a better student by allowing yourself. So don't crumble up your pages when you make a mistake or it doesn't look real. And, you know, keep practicing. We have time for one or two more questions. Okay, great. And, you know, as our author said, this idea came from a lunch meeting. Do you guys think you're going to have some ideas for new books at lunch today? <laughs> yeah, right? Okay, all right. I see one hand over here. Excuse me, guys. All right, right here. Okay, and tell me your name. And then why don't you give a wave to our friends online? Right there. All right, now what's your name and then what's your question? My name is Sion and my friend Lydia wants me to ask this question. Okay, great, go ahead. What happens after Philip was famous? Oh, what happened after Philip was famous? Was he ever famous? Yes, the, the story was passed around. Um, from person to person over kitchen tables and in bar rooms. Um, and after the Civil War, when, sla when, well, actually when he was freed in Washington, D.C., which happened early, at, before the Emancipation Proclamation for the rest of the nation, um, Philip Reed decided now that he's his own man, now that he's free, I think he wanted to get out of that hot foundry because his name shows up in the census. Every 10 years, the, gov the federal government needs to know how many people there are in the country. So they count children, they count men and women, and ask what people do for work. And Philip Reed shows up in those census documents. He had a wife, he had a child, and he worked as a plasterer, and he was well respected as an independent craftsman. So. Our time is up. We are so delighted that you came to see us today. We're so thankful to Sleeping Bear. Can yes, ma'am. I, you know, I just, I, I thought 
thought I heard I thought I heard something from the audience. Um, I I think it's from Alabama. Can you guys hear it? They're asking a question. Okay. Right. We can't hear anything from Alabama. Okay. But they did email us to ask a question. So do you, do we have time for just one more? It's a really good one and something we all should know. So this question is from Alabama. Our friends online emailed us to ask the question. They're watching right now. Can everybody wave to Alabama? Okay. Now they want to know what other children's books have you authored and illustrated for? Well, maybe I'll let you go first because you've illustrated a lot. Yes, I've, I've illustrated over 50 children's books. I usually do history and culture. In the very beginning, I was only doing history because I loved history. And so I did Richard Wright in the library card. I did a book called Only Passing Through the Story of Sojourner Truth, a book called Keep Climbing Girls. But some of the, after a while I started doing more fun books, like Yesterday I Had the Blues, Jazz Baby. It Just <coughs> Happened. It Just Happened, mm -hmm. Black Magic. And I also did a, a, I've done a lot, because I do children's books, but also have done a, a poster for the New York City subway system. And I did a New Kwanzaa Orleans, stamp. Kwanzaa stamp, New Orleans Jazz Festival poster. I keep busy. Well, you have to tell our audience, since we're going a little tiny bit over, you have to tell our audience what you did at a famous celebrity's house. Okay. I, I did a project with Queen Latifah, and it's called Garrett's Gift. Garrett Morgan is the inventor of the automobile traffic light. And we did a little short documentary with a company called Sweet Blackberry. Have you ever seen the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? There's a character on there named Hillary. She wrote the story. It's a little poem. And Queen Latifah narrated it. I did the artwork. And we had a celebration at Jamie Foxx's home. <laughs> So see, if you do all that, you can do it too. Not that I'm bragging now, don't, don't get me wrong. But, but it was, it's always been interesting to do different projects. And I'm telling you, I, I grew up in a really small town. I didn't know I would be doing this. But I, what got me here was practice and confidence. You gotta believe in your own self. Keep practicing, know your craft. And no matter what your circumstances, keep going forward. No matter what people tell you, keep Any doing it. Any final words of advice for us, Stephen? Oh, I just echo that. Keep, keep it, find something that you enjoy and work at that. All of your classes will be useful when you take on a big project. The math, the art, the music, the science, the social studies, it'll all come together. But especially in your own time, pursue things that you like and that'll take you in a good, good place. Thank you very, very, very much. And this time, let's all just clap and say, woo -hoo. <laughs> oh, thank you, Webb, sweet thing.